Thank you very much. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about Cork City's designation as a healthy city. Um, in the last number of years, I've been working on a health profile for Cork City, and I've learned some fascinating things about our city. In fact, I'm going to congratulate us all for being here today, not just at the centre of the universe, the, and as my husband says, the unknown universe of Cork. We've actually survived some phenomenal epidemics throughout the years. We've survived the Black Death in 1349 that took 25 to 35 percent of our population. We survived 14 different epidemics from 1817 to 1879 that include diphtheria, tetanus, typhoid, scarlet fever. We've survived even the main drainage system and scheme of the city throughout the 90s. We're a phenomenal city, really. The health profile of Cork City, um, I suppose to present it, I like to take the kind of the non-statistical approach or the non-medical approach to, to profiling um, the city. I want you to imagine, well, we all know that the population of Cork is 119,000, but I'm going to reduce Cork. Now, we're not a miniature city, but I'm going to reduce us to a miniature city just for five minutes. I want you to imagine that the city of Cork is reduced to a village of just 100 people. In that village of 100 people, a baby born today can expect, a baby girl can expect to live to 82 years, a baby boy can expect to live to 77 years. Females would dominate the village because there'd be 51 females and 49 males in the village. The largest age group in the village would be 24 to 45 year olds, so a young age cohort. 15 people in the village would be over 65 years of age and 15, village in, 15 people in the village would be children under 14 years of age. Of those who finished their education, 15 would have a primary education, 41 would have a secondary education and 28 would have progressed onto a third level education. If the village was to be divided the way we divide our, our country at the moment into areas of advantage or you know, disadvantage, in the parts of the village that were nominated to be extremely disadvantaged, more than half of the people there would have less than a secondary education. In 2007, four people in the village would have been unemployed. Today, 15 are unemployed. 17 people in the village would have a low income that would leave them deprived. 14 people in the village would be non-Irish. There would be a diversity of people. 13 would have a disability and five would be providing unpaid for care and assistance to people with illness and health problems. Two families in the village would be to lone fathers, 10 would be to lone mothers, and one third of those families would live in consistent poverty in the village. 10 would be lesbian, gay, or bisexual. Five of the 15 people who are aged over 65 years of age in the village would live alone. 13 people in the village would live in poor quality housing. If you were to divide the village up on how social housing is allocated, two thirds of social housing would be placed in the northeast and the northwest of the village. 15 people in the village would have felt lonely often in the last four weeks. Six would have been diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. There'd be 15 children living in the village and three of those 15 children would be classified as obese. Three other children would be going to school hungry every single morning. And my favorite one, and the one I love to tell dietitians in my department, is that only one person in the village would manage to follow a diet as per the food pyramid. And to sum up, 85 people in that village would describe their health as good or very good. So that just gives you a synopsis of Cork and Cork City and the health profile that we've carried out of the city. We applied for WHO, or World Health Organization, healthy city status with our health profile. And people often say to me, what's a healthy city? What's that about? For me, a healthy city is about moving away from the individual, from moving away from our individual behaviors to a collective approach to health. So we're, 
really reclaiming health from the health services that really are focused, as, if, you, if you look at it, on illness and illness um, um, treatment, away from that individual approach to collective approach of resilient communities, strong communities, healthy communities. Communities reclaiming health as their own. There's three factors that, I suppose, have a very academic title put on them of a healthy city. And I want to give you a sense of my understanding of what they mean. There's the upstream focus of health promotion, the social determinants of health, and tackling health inequalities. So just to break them down, we start with the upstream focus on health promotion. I want you to imagine that a new graduate from UCC from medicine today is walking, taking a stroll down by the River Lee. And as he walks by the river, he looks in and he notices that somebody's drowning. So he jumps in, anxious, really dying to use his newly acquired medical skills, he wants to save that person. So he jumps in and he pulls the person out and he resuscitates them and he brings them back to life. He's delighted. He's managed to use his medical skills there and then to save somebody's life. But then he looks in the river again and he notices a second person. So again, he jumps in to save the second person. But as he's pulling the second person out, he looks upstream and he sees a third, a fourth and a fifth person in the river drowning and struggling for life. And he realizes, I can't save all of these people on my own. He looks up the river and he sees in the bridge that there's a big hole, that all of these people are falling in over the edge of the bridge and they're drowning. And he says, what can we do? So at the, at the side of the river has gathered a nice little group of community people and they say, what can we do? They decide to call the local community guard to come and um, stop the, the traffic from crossing the bridge. They might call the local county council or the local city council to send the civil engineer out to fix the bridge to prevent further instances occurring. They could call the local community development project to let the people in the village know that there's a problem with the bridge and don't cross the bridge. They could even push the boat out a step further and they could call maybe the civil engineering department in UCC to document and record what's going on with fixing the bridge so that there's evidence for the next village or for the next time this happens, what can be done. That's an upstream focus to health. It's community led and that's at the heart of healthy cities. A second concept that I'd like to get across today is the social determinants of health. And it's a term in my job that gets bandied about a lot. We need to focus on the social determinants of health. For me, an understanding of the social determinants of health is that health is everybody's business. Today, in fact, every day, in Cork University Maternity Hospital, a baby is born every hour. In fact, in the, in the space of our event this afternoon, three babies are going to be born in the hospital. Each of those three babies is going to have a unique genetic makeup. They're going to have a unique family history. They're going to be born to their own set of parents. They're going to be discharged from the hospital within maybe two to three days, and they're going to go in three different directions. Their life experiences and what goes on in their environment, in their community, in their family, their experience of education, their experience of employment, their experience of maybe transport systems um, and access to services is going to shape their health. And those factors are known as the social determinants of health. And those are things that we have control over. Unfortunately, the social determinants of health have different impacts on different groups in society. Some groups in society have better health than other groups in society. A group that I work with in my role in the HSE is the, the traveller community on an ongoing basis. The traveller community will suffer hugely in Ireland from massive health inequalities. To give you an example of that, and I suppose to set the context of that, um, I work with the Traveller Health Unit, um, and I was recently talking to a traveller woman, a mother of five children, and a volunteer in her local traveller community project, and I was asking her how she was getting on, how was life. And she mentioned to me about her youngest child, five years of age, who's just started school. Absolutely delighted to be starting in school, making new friends. He had his own new uniform, he had his brand new school bag, he had his brand new lunchbox. He was going to school for the first time and he was going to get educated and he kept telling her this. 
In the first week of school, he was delighted. He'd the best week of his life. He'd met so many friends and he'd even been invited to a birthday party. But lo and behold, a week later, he came home in tears to tell his mother that he was no longer allowed to go to the birthday party because he lived in a caravan. That child's experience is real and that child's experience will continue, possibly that experience of discrimination more than likely will, ex will continue throughout his life. As a traveler, he's got a 5% chance of completing his leaving cert. And I suppose on reflecting that experience that he's just gone through, I can conclude that why would he stay on in that system? Why would he stay in a classroom where maybe his culture isn't acknowledged? Or maybe where he feels different, where he feels not accepted? Why would he stay in that educational system? Similarly, he's got about a 5% chance of completing full-time employment. He's got 15 years less on this earth than a settled child in the same classroom. That's the health inequality for the traveler population. As a traveler male, he's seven times more likely to die by suicide than a settled male. That's health inequalities. And healthy cities is about addressing health inequalities, about making city life for everybody, about being inclusive. I've put up this slide because it's an example of something. Now, New York isn't a healthy city in, in terms of WHO recognition. But in New York, they've taken some really interesting, an, an interesting slant on health. Mayor Bloomberg has a huge interest in, in health. Um, not quite the way we do it here, but he has a huge interest in terms of preventing obesity. And he's taken massive steps around the city um, to, to make the city more, I suppose, active and um, to reduce obesity levels. There's a huge policy in New York now of cycling. <coughs> 10 years ago, you would not have gotten on a bicycle to cross the city in New York. Today, it's the safest thing to do. It's the most accessible, it's the easiest way to get around the city. Cycling has such a positive impact in terms of carbon emissions, in terms of physical health, in terms of traffic, in terms of en enjoying a city. And you can see from the graph there, the increase in cycling rates that took part that, to, that occurred as a result of, of that policy. But the reality is, is that we can't all be the mayor of a city. But we all can play a role, because the city is for everybody. A healthy city is an inclusive city. A healthy city is not about looking at our 65 plus age group as dependent, um, you know, in terms of statistics. It's about looking at what value they can contribute, because the 65 plus age group offers more in terms of volunteering than any other age group in the city. It's about looking at, at the whole of the, the structure of the city to encompass everybody. It's about inclusivity and it's pro about providing the environment where a traveler child can thrive and can flourish and not just a traveler child but every single member of the, of the city. Thank you.